Hello, this is Jenny Clark with Solvability, and we've got today's Florida GovCon podcast. I'm talking again to Tony Gray because this man knows everything that I need to know about software, te- soft technology, and where that's going. And you've actually created an organization called the Software Technology Association, right, Tony? That's correct, Jenny. And so um, I went to your website, and I just love the images, but it's called the Silent Partners for the Quiet Professionals. Can you explain a little bit about what that means? Sure. Uh, well, the, our organization supports the companies that are delivering technology solutions to special operations personnel, both military and law enforcement. And those individuals are generally referred to as silent professionals or quiet professionals. Um, So our approach is to help promote the growth of the companies as silent partners to those quiet professionals. Well, I think that's a great name for it. And you're the founding founder and director of Soft Technology Association. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and about the group and how you got started with all of this? Sure. Well, I've been involved in the defense industry for about 25 years now, and um, I've supported the special operations community for a majority of that time. And I was also the National Defense Industrial Association chapter president for the Tampa Bay area and helped start that chapter in the early phases about seven years ago. And as president of that organization, we commenced an initiative where we engaged in a dialogue with U.S. Special Operations Command, where on a monthly basis, they provided presentations to our group of about 80 to 100 folks that would meet on a monthly basis to hear speakers from U.S. Special Operations Command talk about technology and their various portfolios of equipment and future requirements to support the special operations quiet professionals. So the Soft Technology Association is a evolutionary enhancement to what we started with NDIA Tampa Bay chapter. And the Soft Technology Association um, is purely a web 2.0 organization. We don't conduct breakfast events or luncheons or conferences. We do everything purely online. And and the reason for that is we wanted to reach a much larger audience than what we had with the NDIA chapter where it was primarily focused on the local Tampa Bay community, which did a great job. And and that process continues for the NDIA Tampa Bay chapter. Uh, it's it's a wonderful organization and continues to uh, engage in the U.S. Special Operations Command dialogue on a monthly basis. So I recommend that organization and those breakfast events that they conduct uh, to anybody that's interested in learning about U.S. Special Operations Command. Uh, but we wanted to reach a much larger global audience. And the reason for that really gets into the overall purpose of the Soft Technology Association. And the character of warfare is drastically changing. And those aren't my words, those are words of senior US military leaders, even uh, business leaders in the industry all acknowledge that the character of warfare is accelerating. And because it's accelerating, so too is technology accelerating. And we have identified the national security imperative to out-innovate our enemies. Um, And our near-peer competitors and our enemies are rapidly evolving their technical capabilities, uh, particularly in the special operations space. So we have to be able to be one step ahead of them. And to do that, uh, we have to rapidly insert new technology 
and deliver that technology to the special operations personnel. And the old processes associated with the traditional defense industry just aren't working as well. They're not as well suited for this new environment that we find ourselves in. And so what we have is the government is expanding their aperture and they're seeking solutions from anybody that has a great idea. Um, because as they say, um, intelligence is equally distributed globally. Unfortunately, opportunity is not. So the Soft Technology Association helps uh, expand that aperture and expose the global community to the opportunities of supporting special operations personnel. That makes so much sense. And what you also are doing is because you're a global organization, you're able to bring best practices from law enforcement and other areas, which is what you were talking about. And it, it's so much broader than what can be handled in a local community with local industry. So I really like what you're talking about. Well, thank you. And, and you're right. The number of special operations organizations is proliferating globally uh, for multiple reasons. And I think all those reasons are exceptional. And as that global market increases, as those special operations organizations increase, we as the U.S. partners uh, encourage them to grow and also adopt advanced technology that help them uh, communicate with us and conduct operations with us safely, efficiently, and effectively. So it's uh, really a win-win for everybody all around. Um, for the U.S. military, for law enforcement, and our global partners. Well, I think when we talk about some of the soft technology innovation, sometimes they're looking for ways that could be funded from other sources and broadening outside just the military is one of those ways because there's applications in all kinds of security situations. So tell me a little bit about what are the goals of the Soft Technology Association? Well, you touched on it, Jenny, and, and that's, you know, one of the biggest challenges for companies is having access to capital. And again, we're focused purely on the technology companies and helping them grow and helping them be effective partners with the military and law enforcement clients. But we focus on delivering capital to our, our members in four specific areas. Um, and those four specific areas are intellectual capital, human capital, and venture capital, and then what I also like to call is customer capital, otherwise known as sales, uh, having customers and having clients. You need those four critical components to be successful in this industry. And what we do is, first of all, we expose our members to as many sources of those ca those sources of capital that we can. So, for example, the customer capital. Um, we are routinely researching almost on a daily basis new opportunities that our members can um, provide solutions to the government clients uh, on a paid basis. Now, most of these opportunities are early stage opportunities, meaning this is a potential prize challenge that the government is sponsoring, and maybe it's a request for information for new technology capabilities. These are all very early stage opportunities where at that stage, everybody has a fair chance of engaging with the client, understanding the needs, and being able to successfully bid and receive a contract. So opportunities are the primary source of content that we provide to our members. And then the other source of content is access to venture capital. And we routinely research sources of venture capital that could benefit the early stage companies in their growth strategies. And the venture capital community 
boy, about five years ago, there really wasn't a lot of venture capital that was focused on government technology. The space is called GovTech now. And in the past five years, though, we've seen a trend where the venture capital community is starting to recognize and invest in early stage gov technology or gov tech companies of which soft technology or soft tech companies are a subset of that so the source of capital is growing uh, we're in the early stages of access to that type of venture capital but we're on an upward trend so we seek to expose our members to as many sources of that venture capital that's out there that we can and then the other area that we research and expose to our members is intellectual capital. And this is in the form of new technology capabilities. And these may be um, R&D or research and development initiatives at universities. Uh, they may be R&D capabilities advertised by companies. These, may, these are early stage technologies that could be adopted and enhanced by our member companies and provided to the special operations communities and the operators. So we promote this shared situational awareness and collaboration about the art of the possible and new technology that could potentially support the operators. And then finally, the human capital component, uh, we have the ability to distribute to our members job opportunities, and they can also post new jobs for their company. And this helps a global community of technology innovators understand all four sources of capital, uh, the current status of how to access that capital, and the trends for the future. Well, being able to get to those type of resources is really, really valuable. Whenever people come to me and say, I'm a government contractor and I've got a venture capitalist issue interested, I'm like, no, you don't. That just doesn't happen. And so I'm encouraged to hear what you're talking about because I'm running into situations where I come across things that I know are pieces of a solution, but I can't, I don't have a good way to advise the company that's involved of how they're going to take it forward. For example, there's a guy on LinkedIn that I connected with that has some kind of sensing mesh for communications and he needs more money. And what I've heard from anybody that is a founder of a either a commercial company or a government contractor is if they've got to go out and seek funding all the time, they're not able to run their company and focus on the development because they're out, you know, making sales pitches all day long, trying to convince people where they are. The other thing is, as you mentioned, this is very early stage technology and people don't want to invest until it's proven, which is really hard to do. You know, how do you hit something when you know it's not going to, you've got to fail for it to start working. So I really like what you're talking about with venture capital, being able to create pockets of this technology where people that are technologists could come to the Soft Technology Association, meet other people and say, you know, I've got this widget and we need a sensor that'll do that. Without creating these relationships and these collisions, you can't move those things forward fast enough, can you? That's true. And the hurdles to operate in, in this business are extremely high. And what we're trying to do is lower the bar for companies to be able to get into this industry. And, and they're kind of in a chicken or the egg scenario. Um, you know, a client won't necessarily buy their product unless they have some sort of a capital or some sort of product. Well, a venture capitalist isn't going to invest in them unless they have some sort of revenue. So they're kind of stuck in a quandary. And then on top of that, they have to try and find these opportunities, which can be extremely difficult because the U.S. government is large. Everybody knows that, and it's very challenging to find opportunities in such a large organization. Um, yes, the government has some very good tools where you can research opportunities, but um, a lot of those tools 
uh, they function nicely, but the data set is so large. So it's kind of like finding a needle in a needle stack, I tell people. You have to really know where to look to find those opportunities. So we simplify it, especially for those non-traditional contractors that are just starting work with the government. Or maybe they just want this to be a minority part of their overall portfolio business that they have. And so we make it a lot easier for them to find those business opportunities, whether those opportunities are clients or capital. I'm glad you brought that up, those hurdles, because there's so many of them. You know, when I think of hurdles for the companies in soft, if they're trying to sell to Department of Defense, those are things that pop into my mind are security clearances and um, getting into the customer, getting known, and also not understanding the terminology. And there's so many of these events where I feel like, how many times do you expect a bunch of guys to show up for pizza and beer to talk about this unless they have a path to revenue at some point in time? The other thing that I've looked at is just the whole idea of when a company does have a component they can use for soft technology, there's almost cost and pricing issues, the things that I deal with that interfere. For example, they'll get a contract because they have a technology maybe they're using for the hedge fund industry. They want to use the same set technology method to apply to um, watching traffic online. And when they, they can get the work, but the government customer always wants to turn it into a time and materials contract that's paid by the hour. That's not the way the software is developed. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Jenny, because the other aspect of our community is uh, the participation of professionals like you, uh, lawyers, uh, bankers, the whole support community that helps companies engage in the defense industry are also involved in the Soft Technology Association. So we try to provide as much content to our members where they can understand what they need to do, but then when they're ready to engage and perform work for the customer, then they also have access to a full suite and broad spectrum of professionals that can help them in finance, in uh, legal aspects of their business, marketing, business development, and the list really goes on and on. So we wanted to provide that that full access capability for our members to really start from scratch and be able to rapidly grow. It helps so much when there are peers in that in that group that say, well, how did you fix that? And here's what we did and here are our hurdles. And that group together can move things forward. It's like, I never know who's going to have the answer because I call it the group brain, where I know that if we put ourselves together, we can answer the question, but we never know how the answer is going to be arrived at because it's all got to ha happen from collaboration. I bring this up and you say, no, that won't work. And then Bill says something different and we get there. Well, and and so our whole group resides in a LinkedIn group that's private. Uh, you have to meet a certain profile to be accepted into the group. Uh, that helps, I think, protect uh, the members that participate to ensure that all of the folks that are in the group are professionals. Um, the content that's posted in the group is highly curated. Um, so there aren't any distractions in the content that you see. And because this is a qualified group of individuals, it makes it very easy now for somebody that may be new, just starting off in this industry now, to reach out to other members of the group and have a discussion, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or even a group discussion, to understand answers to a particular topic, whether that topic is how to run your business, to operate in the defense industry, or maybe it's a technical topic. You need a partner to maybe uh, provide a component for an overarching solution that you might deliver. Um, so that's a real powerful aspect of our group is the collaborative nature of the organization. Well, it certainly helps to have that. So can you talk about some of the opportunities that you're seeing for companies? I think you were telling me that um, moving in the direction more toward products and away from services, is that a trend you're seeing? What are the opportunities? Well, this is the really exciting part, Jenny. 
the opportunities are just like the character of warfare. The opportunities are ex accelerating, uh, especially in the special operations community. Um, there was uh, initiative probably about five or six years ago to to really focus on what they call agile acquisition, and that developed into multiple initiatives, but one in particular that has been fantastic, it's located in Tampa, Florida, it's called Softworks. And Softworks was started about two years ago, maybe a little bit longer. And it's an innovation center that is managed by a nonprofit called DefenseWorks. And Softworks is a physical location in Tampa, Florida, and Softworks conducts prize challenges. Softworks conducts uh, open research initiatives, collaborative events, um, and it's just a fantastic organization and really has served as kind of a role model for other new initiatives within the Department of Defense. The Air Force just started a very similar organization called AFWorks. Uh, AFWorks is also managed by the nonprofit De DefenseWorks organization. Uh, the Air Force also has CyberWorks that focuses on cybersecurity. So we're starting to see a lot of emphasis placed not only by SOCOM on agile acquisition initiatives like SoftWorks, but also the joint services. So um, all of the services are seeking ways to reach traditional and non-traditional defense contractors much faster. And one other organization that started a couple of years ago is an uh, organization called DIUX. DIUX is headquartered in Silicon Valley. That's where it was initiated by the Secretary of Defense. And that organization has a great success as well with identifying non-traditional defense contractors and commencing work with them much faster than what has been done in the past. And so this is a very exciting trend of opportunities for non-traditional and traditional defense contractors. And what we're also seeing in the industry side of this equation is innovation centers or investment centers by the large defense contractors that are building, for all practical purposes, their own version of a softworks. They're building innovation labs and they're also building innovation funds. So these are venture capital funds where they're investing in early stage technology companies and then uh, collaborating with them through the various growth phases. And then one other area that has been, been very innovative, and this one has been around for a while, is an organization called InQtel. InQtel is a partnership between the CIA and the state of Virginia, and it's a venture capital fund. And that was started, I believe, close to about 10 years ago and has had tremendous success. Um, one of the biz biggest success examples is Palantir. Uh, Palantir is a privately owned company and it's one of the largest, what they call unicorns in uh, the commercial world. It's valued now at $20 billion. And InQtel was one of the early stage investors in Palantir. Another great example of uh, private equity funded or company that is now supporting the defense industry is SpaceX. And SpaceX, I think, is valued at about $21 billion. And that is unprecedented in our industry. We've never had a situation where private equity funding initiated the development of a company that now is a major player in the defense industry. So the ball game is changing. The opportunities are rapidly increasing, and that's where SOFTA really comes into play, is serving as one central clearinghouse for all of these opportunities, uh, because they're growing so quickly, unless you have your finger on the pulse of each of these organizations, you could miss out.
So we research and monitor all of these opportunity sources, provide that information in one central clearinghouse on our LinkedIn group page, and folks get real-time updates if they're members. Membership is free to individuals, and then we have paid corporate membership that provide additional benefits. So this whole ecosystem helps our defense industry members capture the rapidly expanding opportunities. Well, I'm fascinated that you talk about Palantir and SpaceX because I was racking my brain to remember. All I can remember is it started with a P because didn't Palantir create a new way to analyze data in the field? And so the guys on the ground really liked it, but there was an embedded old system. And I think they had to go to the Supreme Court to get all the way through. Does that sound familiar? Well, I'm I'm not terribly sure about the legal aspects, but you're correct in that Palantir has developed an uh, intelligence analysis software solution, mm -hmm. and that solution is used not only by the U.S. military, it's used by law enforcement, and it's used by the commercial world as well. So they have a diversified portfolio of clients, of which the U.S. military is a significant component of it. And again, I think it's a very good example of how the nature of our industry is changing. Uh, organization, companies like this did not exist 20 years ago, uh, 30 years ago. That's, that's not the way the defense industry generally operated. Um, back then, it was the Cold War, what folks um, referred to as the, the, the first and second offset. Uh, but now folks have characterized our current world and the current state that we're in as the third offset, um, which is a hybrid technology environment that's largely impacted by artificial intelligence, robotics, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, and a couple of other technologies that are all coming together to drastically change the character of warfare. Well, and those are really fast coming changes. The other thing with um, Elon Musk and SpaceX is um, he said, well, I can, I can use those rockets again. And um, he saved, what, 40 percent off the other cost. And what you're doing is moving money away from the embedded old line. Let's keep our proprietary technology. Let's protect all this to um, companies that are trying to find not only ways to solve the problem better, but to solve it less expensively because it's a more competitive, more open market for that. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a great observation, Jenny. Um, the, the nature of how companies engage with the government has changed. And instead of the five-year process or a 10-year process where you had a contract for that time period and the government was very specific about their requirements and uh, systems were built, um, sometimes very proprietary, and it made it very difficult for other companies to um, support those initiatives and those programs and they were extremely complex and they moved relatively slowly. Now what we're seeing is a shift towards speed. And now a company may develop a product and deliver it to the, the warfighter. And they do that in a very rapid time frame. And if they do that well, then they know that they're building a strong relationship with that customer base where that customer is going to be inclined to work with them again in the next iteration or on the next platform. So the companies that I have seen be successful in this new space in the third offset understand that it's all about taking care of the warfighter as quickly as possible. Uh, the money will still be there on the back end. You just have to be able to deliver, deliver quickly with high quality. A lot different um, opportunities are being created in that. So, you know, what are some of the game changers that are happening in business development? I think if people are used to going down the same path of, okay, we watch this opportunity that's coming up, we wait for the contract renewal, we'll wait for this, we'll go through this process, we'll do the RFP. 
totally not the way it's going to be happening in the future. What are, what are the game changers in business development? Sure. And I think you have the LinkedIn article link posted in the show notes or in the PowerPoint slides that f folks can take a look at. Yeah, I will do that. Okay, great. Yeah, th that article summarizes uh, seven key points where I see the business development practices changing. And the first area is it, it kind of speaks to my last point to you where I characterize it as innovation as a service. Again, where you're not focused on extending one program as long as possible, making it highly proprietary. Now it's more focused on delivering capability as quickly as possible and then moving on to the next solution in an evolutionary pattern. Um, some folks have characterized that or defined that type of movement as prototype warfare, where uh, depending on the risk level of the customer, um, a 3.0 is good enough. You don't need a 4.0. You don't need an A plus on that particular product. Uh, you can move on with a 3.0 and deliver that capability and then move on to the next solution. Um, it's all about speed and it's all about building this mindset, a business development mindset of providing innovation as a service. What you're really selling now is not just a widget and a, and, a, and a product for a specific program, what you're selling now is your value to the customer, which is all about your innovative, innovation capability. Um, another area that's changing the nature of business development is the collaboration and how collaboration is focused on learning. Um, you know, there's an old adage, um, well, I don't say it's old, but there's an adage in the new paradigm that says, fail fast for speedy success. And what we wanna be able to do is identify when a product isn't working, then let's call it quits. It's clearly not working, let's move on to the next thing. And let's do that as a collaborative team where we can all acknowledge that that particular solution didn't work, but let's learn about why it didn't work and then let's take those lessons learned and make the next solution better. So there's hyper collaborative continual learning. Uh, another aspect of the nature of business development changing is social networks are becoming a strategic asset. And that's why we focused the Soft Technology Association in a purely web 2.0 environment where it's the network that will defeat the enemy network. And we have, we have to have a network of technologists that can collaborate effectively with the warfighters to rapidly deliver those solutions faster than our near peer competitors and the enemy. Um, another aspect too is, is pragmatism about the platforms and the platforms are aircraft, ships, tanks, vehicles, you name it. Um, in the past, the mindset was let's build a new tank, let's build a new ship, let's build a new plane. And what we've seen is as soon as we've built that new plane or that new ship, uh, the near peer competitors or enemy have come up with a comparable solution, uh, maybe copied it pretty effectively. Uh, or they figured out some way to potentially defend against it. So, um, and that can be very costly to um, invest so much in new platforms. So the new mindset is, okay, we have very good platforms. Let's see what we can do about maximizing the efficiency of those platforms. It goes back to the SpaceX example that you gave they came up with a way where they could reuse their booster phases. And so that creates a tremendous amount of efficiency. A booster is a booster is a booster. The important part is what's in, inside the capsule. Um, so that's kind of the same mindset that's taking place right now where we're trying to get the most amount of value by leveraging the existing platforms we had. A good example that I, I recently read about this week is where the Navy took a, an Army uh, missile launch system 
and they placed it on the deck of an amphibious ship. Mm -hmm. And so never done before. They just strapped it down to the, the deck of an amphib and then they launched missiles off of it. Great idea. Uh, now you have a, a missile capable amphibious craft and it didn't cost a lot of money. All you did was uh, rented a crane, placed the missile launcher right on the deck of the, the amphib and, and, and you have now uh, an increase in capability. So there's that innovative approach to what can we do to maximize what we have right now. Um, and then, you know, the, uh, the final point, and there are others that you can read about in the LinkedIn article, but it, it comes down to the culture. Um, you know, the culture is, is very oriented towards innovation. Um, and what can we do to engage with the operators to first understand what their challenges are? And, and it's changing on a daily basis. Uh, depending on the threat profile of the enemy and the near peers, based on the tactics and techniques and procedures used by our personnel. And so you have to have an intimate understanding of what today's challenges are for the operator. And what we have to do as industry is paint for them a picture of the art of the possible. Um, because if you ask, uh, an operator about what type of technical capability they would like to see two years from now, they're operators, they're trigger pullers, they are experts at what they do, they are not technologists. I mean, some may be, um, they're extremely bright folks, um, but it's our responsibility as industry to continually show them the art of the possible and be proactive as opposed to reactive. And I think that's probably one of the biggest differences between what we had before and where we're heading into now in the defense industry is proactively engaging the warfighters with a bunch of new capabilities. And um, with that kind of proactive engagement, I think you get a much faster re return on investment for your efforts. And we're seeing the organizations like Softworks, Afworks, uh, DIUX, really opening up that channel of communication. So industry, uh, academia, all the technical experts can have a more robust dialogue with the operators and, and get that very valuable feedback early on. And that does make such so those, a big difference. Yeah, it, it definitely does. And we're seeing we're seeing early successes already. Uh, DIUX has a number of successes in a very short period of time. Softworks uh, on a on almost a, a weekly basis is um, producing new capability for operators. Um, it, it's really exciting where our industry is moving. What I really like about Softworks is the way they're also involving what they call citizen scientists. I went to one of their events and I'm not a technology person, but my interest in all of this is making sure that there's a way for the small businesses to navigate the, the GovCon, the accounting and things like that when the need arises. But what I liked about what their approach was is they had teams from all over and one of the challenges they had was to um, if you've got a dog that you're jumping out of an airplane, we want an oxygen mask for them because, um, you know, dogs OK when they get down on the ground. But it would be nicer if they, you know, had a ma an oxygen mask, just like the operator from jumping out of these pretty high places. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, with the engagement that ha Softworks has with the technology community, they, they have a very expansive network of innovators. And all we are doing as Softa is helping attract more innovators to that ecosystem, to that Softworks ecosystem. But at the same time, also helping those same innovators find similar opportunities, perhaps at Department of Homeland Security or uh, within the intelligence community or within the joint services that may be uh, 
promoting prize challenges, early stage opportunities that are very similar to the work that they're doing for the special operations community. And now they can start to build a business with a diversified portfolio of federal clients. Well, the other thing that Softworks really emphasizes dual use technologies. I know they've had um, things where they were saying, where we're looking at um, what can hospitals use, what can um, med what medical devices are adaptable, because you've got to train, you've got to take care of a soldier that might be wounded, but that same type of technology could be used in a trauma care setting. That's true, and and that aspect is critical for building a viable defense business or a soft technology business. So that's why SOFTA doesn't just focus on military and federal government. We also say that we help promote soft technology to law enforcement organizations all the way down to local law enforcement because um, a lot of the use cases, a lot of the TTPs are very similar. The technology can be applied not only to the federal and U.S. military special operations organizations, but it also can be applied to uh, law enforcement. And sometimes it's a little bit easier for a company to perhaps start with selling their product to law enforcement versus starting with the federal government that may have more stringent requirements. Um, but by the same token, if a company is successful in delivering a capability to the federal government, they now can sell to um, state and local organizations uh, and to the first responders. And so that builds a much larger portfolio for companies to be able to sell their products. You know, it kind of follows a, a, a bell curve. And the old bell curve was if you built a product for the military, uh, that's pretty much it. You just built it for the military and maybe you were lucky in finding other foreign militaries to use your product as well, but that's pretty much where it stopped. Now what we're seeing is with the commoditization of especially command and control tools, situation awareness tools, software systems, um, you can start in the federal sector and then as the federal sector um, changes their requirements and look for the next capability, the next best capability from you. Now you can continue your sales into the law enforcement, state and local space and continue to harvest revenue from that product. So essentially what you have is a bunch of bell curves, product bell curves now that you can, you can build upon. So each time you deliver something for the federal government, now when it hits a, a phase where um, it can be uh, adequately sold to the, fe the state and local clients, meaning it's at a price point that they can afford. Um, there aren't any security issues with providing that capability to state and local. Um, you can diversify your portfolio and grow your revenue uh, significantly. Well, I like the idea of diversification, and I feel like it's giving more opportunities for companies that would not otherwise have gone after defense to participate. And what you're really talking about is instead of developing products, they're developing capabilities that are adaptable and can be used in a lot of different industries. So you're going to be speaking at the Florida GovCon Summit, February 28th and March the 1st in Orlando. And like you, my focus is trying to connect the people that want to have this information. So mm -hmm. um, I'm really glad that you're going to be joining me with um, at the Florida GovCon Summit. We're expecting quite a number of people to be there. But um, I did put on this uh, closing slide the link to your third offset article, and um, I will publish that in the, sh the show notes. And what's the best way for somebody to get in touch with you, Tony? Well, by email, and I think you have it posted on the show slides. So it's Gray T at specopstech.org, and that's also part of your logo that we're showing. So um, I will publish that and, and let people know about it. Um, the Florida GovCon Summit is coming up. It's going to be two days. It's focused on what I call the second stage small business in federal contracting. They've learned how to win contracts 
but now they need the information that to, in order to grow and they need to be more selective about what they're going after and what directions they head. So we've got an amazing lineup of people to speak at that and I'm really looking forward to having your presentation. Tony, we're also gonna have some round tables at this event where I wanna bring companies that I know are in other parts of the state that are in related technologies and get the people mm -hmm. that don't know each other to, mm -hmm. um, to be connected. So thanks so much for being on Florida GovCon podcast today, Tony, and I look forward to uh, talking to you again soon. Thank you, Jenny, and I look forward to talking to everyone at the GovCon Summit. All right, thanks a lot, Tony. Thank you, Jenny.